I'd like to welcome you all here and those who will be watching us later uh, on, on YouTube. I'm assuming that you've all read all 14 verses in chapter 13 of Romans, right? And Linda has read them over and over and over. She probably hasn't memorized. This is the chapter in Romans that people often cite to tell them which political party to belong to. <laughs> and I, that's the reason I keep searching. I don't find that answer there. But as we saw in Romans 12, where it shows us, where, where Paul is showing us, obviously with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how to relate to God, how to relate to other believers, and how to, rate, uh, how to uh, relate to the wider world. The wider world is about to get really, really complex and practical at the same time. So, beginning in verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Here's the part I know you were all waiting for. For this cause pay you tribute also. Pay your taxes, is what he's saying. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. I'd like to stop at the end of the seventh verse, the first half of this chapter, before we go on to the next verses and discuss these just a little bit. We live in a different kind of society than the Apostle Paul did. Paul was writing from Corinth, most probably, when he wrote this, which is a Roman colony, to the capital of the Roman Empire, which was not known for its form of representative government at the time. The Republic had collapsed earlier than this, um, they tried to maintain it uh, through the life of Julius Caesar and failed. And after that, they began to have a series of emperors. That's not what we would consider a representative democracy as such. <clears throat> this is the same government, not the same administration, but certainly the same government, that eventually will take Paul's life. Do you think he knew that when he wrote this? Well, he's telling them not to resist the powers that be. And he doesn't say, don't resist the good powers and ignore the bad ones. Rome was not a great friend if you were not Roman. Now, Paul was Roman, and they still took his life. But my question is, when he wrote these truths under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, do you believe, or do we have reason to believe, that Paul knew that he would lose his life in the very city where he's sending this letter? My answer to that question, was, which is a conjectural question, is yes. Because you remember back when Paul is blind in the city of Damascus, and God comes down and tells Ananias to go pray for him, that he was a chosen vessel, and that he was to show him all things that he must suffer for my sake. Now, all things is all things. Suffering is suffering. Not only what he was going to endure, but what he was going to allow. 
Didn't Agabus, isn't he the one that bound his hands? Agabus is the one uh, who, yeah, took uh, Paul's belt. And bound his hands and said, "This is if you go but up to Paul Jerusalem." Paul wasn't surprised by that. Everybody else was, but Paul was like, "Well, I'm, I, I have to go anyway." So to me, it felt like Paul knew it was almost a prophecy for everybody else around. Yes, not for Paul. Not necessarily for Paul. And there's several schools of thought on that one. There are some who look at that and they say, "Agabus," it says, "spoke to Paul through the Spirit." that Paul ignored that and went up to Jerusalem anyway. Uh, I'm not of that school of thought. Well, it's true, Paul did ignore what Agabus told him through that gift of prophecy, actuated by the Spirit of God. But Agabus wasn't showing him it was because he was going to... <laughs> it didn't matter whether he went to Jerusalem or not, Paul knew he was going to Rome. Yeah. That's the thing. And the fact that he would be bound at Jerusalem, it was going to happen somewhere. So I don't think Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles and as a prophet of God, ever stepped out of the will of God. I think the problem is we don't understand why, many times, prophecies are given until after they have manifested. Then we can understand. We see in part, we prophesy in part. I think Paul had the picture. And let's not forget, he was the one who said, we prophesy in part. But there we are. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So where do you think that puts our founding fathers? George Washington, Ben Franklin, those wonderful revolutionaries that we, whose memories we hallow and... Uh, Celebrate every 4th of July for their accomplishments. I didn't expect you to get all this quiet. These are practical questions. Where does it put them? Yeah, where does it put them? Well, uh, that's fine about George and everybody else. I mean, they, they were from God. That authority came from God. Yeah, but they're resisting a power that already existed. They did. And See the thorny mess we get into? Oh, yeah. Same with today. No, the you betcha. The questions are always black and white. The answers are not always black and white. There's another exception to this. Has anybody thought of it? George Washington and... Ben Franklin and Alexander Hamilton and Nathan Hale and all those guys were resisting a power which held its seat of authority at that time by divine right. And they cited these verses. There is no power but of God. And to resist the power that exists is to resist the ordinance of God. Now, I'm going to ask the question again. Where does that put George Washington at all under the rubric of uh, verses uh, 2 and 3 in Romans 13? And our entire national history since. Well, the simple answer would be in rebellion. Mm-hmm. In the rebellion. Mm -hmm. in rebellion against an established power. Oh, yes. Now, Hitler was an established power. Really, really established. And was pretty powerful. And he was resisted. Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer wrestled with that. And we consider Bonhoeffer a, a saint of God. A martyr, right? Yeah, and a martyr. So close to the end of the war. So close. You want me to answer the question for you? Because I can't. Only you can answer the question, this kind of question for yourself. And it comes with the exception which is established in Acts 5. So if we'll turn to Acts 5, 
we're going to look at another established power <coughs> through another apostolic voice. This one will be Peter. Acts 5, beginning in verse 27. And when they had brought them, the they are, this is Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, had brought them, the apostles, they set them before the council, there's the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked them, you know, in Israel, you don't get a higher authority than the priest, saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now there's a black and white answer to a complex question, which involved doctrine and a number of other things. And that's what Peter gave. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now there's the mouths of two witnesses. The Holy Spirit himself and the witness of the apostles. Which witness, by the way, is confirmed by the Holy Spirit in the fact that you'll notice that the witness of the apostles from there on is recorded in Scripture, and there's not much of the minutes of the Sanhedrin that the Holy Spirit kept. There's your witness. He confirmed what those apostles were saying. So, when Peter says, we ought to obey God rather than man, that is a command. Now, the reason why I say it's a complex question and I can't answer it for you is not that I would care to dodge the question because Linda will tell you I'm very happy to answer other people's questions for them, just as long as they don't apply to me. Um, you hold, if you are a believer, a dual citizenship, which is a concept alien to us in the United States because under the laws of the United States, we don't acknowledge dual citizenship. Canada does. Mexico does. But we do not. We view you are either a citizen of the United States or you're not. You are not a citizen of the United States and something else. Mexico, for instance, if you have uh, a parent who's an American citizen and one who's a Mexican citizen, they will recognize dual citizenship until you reach the age of majority, at which time you can decide for yourself. But until then, they will recognize uh, dual citizenship. Canada will recognize dual, citizen, dual citizenship in perpetuity. Other nations will as well. But we don't. So this business about a dual citizenship is a little foreign to us. So what do I mean by a dual citizenship? And I'll explain it to you this way. Mansfield and the United States of America are in the same country. Did you know that? And I can prove that by saying that the United States of America declared war on Japan the same day that Mansfield did. Think about it. That's how we look at things. We don't look at things from the big picture down. We look from where we are, that little center of the universe that we form, and look out the other way. So Mansfield is in the United States of America. And when the United States of America declared war on Japan, the citizens of Mansfield owed their, uh, uh, their loyalty to Japan or to the United States. The United States, obviously. And not because they had decided to declare war on Japan. The United States had that claim on the citizenship of every person in that country prior to that because we're born here. That makes us a citizen. Or we're naturalized. A lot of our parents and grandparents were. And that makes them a citizen. They have that claim of that loyalty and obedience to whatever law is written by that authority. Until you run into the problem that Peter did, where a command of the civil law 
would require you to break the command of God. There is your first citizenship if you are a believer. And the reason I say first citizenship <clears throat> if the word of God is eternal and I believe that it is then we have to have a look at Philippians 3.20 I believe that's where we want to go We'll get back to Romans 13. Count on it. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We hear this preached a lot at funerals, and some of us lately have had a lot more experience with those than we'd care to, but we hear that. But it isn't restricted to that. See that word conversation? It's not table talk. This is not conviviality around the buffet at breakfast or at lunch. Conversation is citizenship. Manner, mode, and place of living. Citizenship. Now, I want you to notice it says it is in heaven. Not something to look forward to. This is possessed now by every believer. Yes. Now, if we're looking... Did you find that, Linda? I see a perplexed look. No, we're just checking the scripture. Did I give a wrong one? I didn't know whether... Three. Yeah, I guess that's what I was showing. Three twenty. Now well, this is after we have been advised that there will be those who will, in verse nineteen, whose glory is in their shame and who mind earthly things. Our earthly citizenship is an earthly thing. It takes it is subservient to your first citizenship which is in heaven, which this is not the only place in scripture where that is spoken of as a present tense possession. Okay? Uh, Hebrews 12. If you're in my school of thought and you believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, I can't prove it to you, but that's what I believe. Um, let's have a look at Hebrews 12, 18. <clears throat> Speaking to believers... For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched. He's speaking about Mount Sinai. And that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they heard, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much, as a beast touched the mountain, that it should be stoned and thus through with a dark. Now that is how holy... Uh, Sinai, Mount Horeb, had become by virtue of the presence of Almighty God in descent, all right, when he descended to that mount. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Now he's speaking to us if this word is eternal, because the Hebrews to whom this was originally read are all dead. I just want to point that out. And Paul doesn't write to the dead, he writes, or no, no writer of scripture writes to the dead, they write to the living. So read this for yourself in the present tense. If you are a believer, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not geographical Jerusalem, not the one that sits over there on seven hills. We're not talking about the Mount Zion there on the Kidron, above the Kidron Valley. We are talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, the real one, the higher one which is the mother of us all. The heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, 
and to the spirit of just men made perfect. <laughs> now do you see your position as a believer and where your citizenship is? Your citizenship is also your ultimate destination if you are a believer. If you can point to a point where you have truly repented and turned the life over to the lordship of the only one who is Lord, this is your citizenship. Not my word, not my idea. I'm not making it over complex. This is one of those positions where it either is or it isn't, and you get to decide. Simple fact. Tremendous eternal consequences. Now we go back to Romans. You that as a citizen when you say decide. You, you decide you're going to be a citizen. You decide whether or not you have repented or a need to. And based on that, that makes you believe. If you do repent and you do believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For whosoever right, come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Then, by rebirth, you are born again. Born again. And And as Jesus taught and us, we are born from above, that heavenly Jerusalem. Yes, right. And therefore, you're now out of the citizen mm -hmm. of heaven. But that now becomes, whereas before, my earthly citizenship was prime, primal or mm -hmm. prior, primary. Or whatever, remember, back in the now, now. remember back in our Genesis study when we were talking, Genesis was the book of one beginning and many firsts. And one of the firsts we were shown is the parallel, and I don't use type, but I use parallel, between physical and spiritual. The physical of a fallen world cannot type the spiritual which hasn't fallen and can't be lost. All right, There isn't anything physical that can't be lost, including the earth and the heaven itself. Mm -hmm. That heavenly Jerusalem, that city which builder and maker is God, is untouchable. By anything physical. And he holds it in his power and in his timing. All right. We are shown that now in this dual citizenship. We also saw it when we were talking about the new and the old nature earlier in the book of Romans, that they coexist, but one, through the indwelling power of the living God, can overcome the other. And it's the same way with the citizenship. They mirror each other. Not in all respects, but the final destination is always the same. The eternal weight of glory. Making myself clear here? Now, I'm not saying that in this country we have come to a point where um, one is going to have to make a determination between the obedience to the state and the obedience to God, but I believe it's coming, and not just here, but in all nations. And it may be coming a lot sooner than we think. It has come in many portions of this earth, present tense already. You're not going to be uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, you're not going to be in uh, communist China, um, a professing Christian, and live freely and sometimes even at all. And we look in this country, even now, at the, well, first it was, we've always had the issue of anti-Semitism. And synagogues and temples are defaced and vandalized and bombed. And now it's Jewish synagogues and Catholic churches. Look at what's happening in Catholic churches today. It won't stop there. Any assembly where the name of Christ is named, regardless of why it's named, will fall under that power of the beast. There's no question about it. If you delve it all into the book of Revelation, which I have no intent of going into this morning. <laughs> so let's get back to the practicality of what Paul is showing us. This one who knew that he would be going to Rome. This one who knew that he was going to give his life to the gospel at the polite invitation of the state. 
For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. We really want to say that about Nero? Or Caligula? Or Hitler? Yeah, well, who put him there? There's the $64,000 question. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, same thing, right? Nebuchadnezzar, the caliphates, or whatever, they, whatever, whatever title you want to mm -hmm. put on them. Well, he was the head of gold. In Daniel's day. Yeah, he was the head of gold. You didn't get more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar. They all descend in quality of those, those metals from him down right. to our own time of iron and clay. And even the iron is getting a little rusty these days. But they are appointed, um, excuse me, I want to read this correctly. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Well, there was a lot of that wasn't good under Nebuchadnezzar. I don't expect that prior to their being thrown into it, the fiery furnace had a great attraction for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the fourth man in the fire took them through it. And they came out, and they were appointed to great things. There are other Christians where that hasn't happened to, Paul being one of them. And probably every other apostle, uh, if we can trust to uh, history, other than John himself, uh, suffered martyrdom. But here we have these words. They were appointed minister of God to thee for good. All right, let's go back and look at the institution of government, which begins in huh, Genesis 6, when Noah comes out of the ark, when God states, if you shed man's blood by man, shall your blood be shed. That is not a suggestion or a guideline. It is a decree. By man shall your blood be shed. That means he's given to, uh, to, to people. The authority of government, through the authority of government, the right to take the human life, and it stays there. It doesn't descend to the individual citizens, except in self-defense. Every person under, under the law and under uh, uh, most civil order has the right of self-defense. Might not be able to have the right to define what that self-defense may be. We have an incident on a subway at a chokehold lately, which is coming up on the issue of, uh, of self-defense that we'll have to see about. And so I'm going to say something which may startle some in this room, and maybe some of you on YouTube. Because Genesis stands there under the decree of Almighty God, I do not believe in the sanctity of life. I believe that it is sacred to God. He has entrusted government with that power under certain circumstances. Now, and, and it also tells us here to be you know careful because... In verse 4, uh, he beareth not the sword in vain. How many of you have stumbled into the almost inescapable uh, videos and pictures of the coronation which took place yesterday in Great Britain? Did you notice when they process into the abbey, that wonderful great sword which is borne before the monarch? You didn't see it. It's carried in before him. It's in a scabbard. And that scabbard is got all kinds of jewels and gold and wonderful. And I don't know how long it is, but somebody hold it straight up. <laughs> and then he's crowned. Then the scabbard comes off. And when he processes out, the sword is carried before him unsheathed. And it indicates what they used to believe in Great Britain. And that was that the that, by the way, that name of that sword is, well, it's called two things. It's the sword of offering and the sword of justice. And it's only the king's as the head of state. No one else's. Power of capital punishment, as a matter of fact, of all punishment, is vested in the state and in no one else. Now, I don't know how many people in Great Britain realize that about the sword. That's why it's carried, and that's why it's, un it's, why it's sheathed when he comes in, unsheathed when he goes out with the crown. Because once the crown is put on his head, he has become the head of state. He always was the king. From the moment that his mother died, he was the king. 
but he's not the head of state until he wears that crown. They put it on him, and the receipt comes off the sword. And it indicates that the power of the state has the power of life and death over its citizens and the command upon its loyalty and obedience. This is where they get that. It's also called the sword of mercy and justice. The indication of the sword is that it is wielded by the state to defend innocence and good and to punish and destroy evil. That's why it's given that name. Harks back to this. Shows you how far we've, we've strayed from biblical concepts. Um, we may not like it, but the Word of God authorizes the death penalty, which has been outlawed in Great Britain for how many years? And they're still dragging around that sword? I hope they don't let it rust. And if it does rust, I hope it's on someone else's blood other than my own. I'm always very, very courageous as long as I have the Atlantic Ocean between me and that sword. <laughs> if we're on this side, I'd probably speak a little differently. But that's the history of that. Harks back to what Paul is saying. And what Paul said is true. But what do you do about that guy who is a jerk and he's in office? You can do that for sure. Pray for a change of heart because the heart of the king is in the hand of God. But look at what this says. For he is a minister of God to thee. It doesn't say to the state. It doesn't say to the country, the province, the colony. It says to thee for good. I don't care who he is and I don't care what office he holds. Maybe it's a town councilman. Maybe it's a mayor, maybe it's a county commissioner, maybe it's a governor, maybe it's a state legislator, maybe it's the president of the United States. If there is one. And they hold their office, according to Paul, under the authority of God, and therefore they are responsible to God to do good to you. And if they don't do that, now who they're responsible to? The same one to whom we are supposed to reserve vengeance. And trust me, he knows how to take it. He knows how to exact it. Not the way we would, necessarily, or even in our timing. But righteously, and justly, and thoroughly. Vengeance is mine. Can you show me anything else that God has that he doesn't use well? Even vengeance. Yes, you can pray for that person. You can pray for that office. You can pray for yourself. We're told to pray for those who are in authority over us that we might live quiet lives. Oftentimes, I hear myself mouthing that prayer, asking not for quiet times, but better ones. Quiet is all I'm assured of. And not necessarily the kind of quiet, which means no riot in the streets, no, you know, no perplexity, but it's that peace that God gives which passes understanding that you don't really appreciate till you have. And I think consequently many times that's some of the reasons why we as, as fallen creatures fail to ask for it. But Paul's touching on that here. It is a responsibility of the citizen uh, simply put, non-scripturally, uh, I remember a point where I was lamenting to an older politician at the time, and in those times all politicians were older than I was, that I was poorly represented. And the old guy looks at me and he kind of closes one eye down, kind of like getting the range. And he's looking right at me and he says, you know what that means? Yeah, it means I'm, I could... He says, it means it's your fault. If you're poorly represented in a republic, it's your fault. You're not working hard enough for your representation. If you can't find somebody to do it, go out and run yourself. Now, you can disagree, but don't say that you are poorly represented unless you want to care to admit that you're at fault. Now, I'm not saying we have a jerk in office, it's our fault. I'm not saying that. But pray for both sides of that equation. The citizen and whoever holds that authority at whatever level he does. 
That doesn't mean we represent, we, that doesn't mean that we have to, to reverence the life of an individual that is not worthy of admiration or respect. But the office and the position is a whole different thing. We establish those in this country, I think, still, don't we? We did declare that we will have a president, we'll have senators, we'll have... We said that as a people in Congress assembled. So it's our words that we are actually honoring in this country. Or at least they were for quite a while. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, this is verse 5, uh, not only for wrath, that's that thing we fear because the, you know, uh, uh, it does not carry that sword in vain. That's the wrath. We have to be careful of that. But also for conscience sake. We owe responsibility to God's ministers, not only to the office of that minister, but to the God who gave it. There's your conscience. A leader can't speak to your conscience. A leader can't get between you and your conscience. But for conscience sake, What do you do when the revelation of Almighty God says you owe it to God to be as good a citizen as you can be in good conscience? When it violates your conscience, it violates the law of God. If, in fact, you're a reader of this word, we don't get a conscience anywhere else. A God consciousness, certainly, certainly not. For this cause, pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom fear is to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Remember when the, um, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and they were uh, asking him, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar? And Jesus says, hmm, good question. Show me a coin that you'd pay it with. Well, it's a Roman coin. Well, whose picture's on it? Well, Caesar's. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you give... To Caesar, what's Caesar's, and give to God, what's God, and both of them will be happy. And they didn't like his answer. <laughs> that is good politics, and it's smart theology. And they asked the real one they should ask. They, the problem was, they didn't get the answer they wanted. So Peter comes around, and he says, Hey, boss, do we pay taxes or not? And Jesus says, well... God has everything. If you're a children of the kingdom, and he, now he gives the physical analogy to that, do the children of the king pay taxes? Well, certainly not. Oh, so aliens to the family would pay taxes? Yes. Okay, but in order that we not offend them, why don't you go down, take a hook and a line, one line, one hook, throw it in the Sea of Galilee here, and pull out the first fish that comes up to your hook, and look in his mouth, and oh, my goodness sake, there was enough money to pay the tribute for both Jesus and Peter. Go down, pay for me and for you. In order that he wouldn't give offense. Doesn't mean that he is doing it to be right with God. He's doing it so he doesn't give offense to someone he is supposed to respect because his father put them there too. Now there's your example. See why I say it can get a little thorny? Verse 8 is a good one. Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another fulfills the law. Have you ever heard that before? That love fulfills the law? How so? How does love kill a goat? Or a bullock? Or a lamb? But love fulfills the law. And let's not forget, Romans is written by a guy who really knows the law. He's a Pharisee. And he explains it. This happens a lot, and we look over it, but I want to point out, for he, uh, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law has been rattled around more seminaries than I could count, and what it means and what it doesn't mean and what it purports to mean. That's verse 8. But verse 9 is the commentary. Now, this isn't MacArthur's commentary, and it's not Schuler's commentary, and it's not my commentary. This is the Bible commenting on itself, which is the trustworthy commentary. For this, 
Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now watch verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. The law said thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Well, if you love your neighbor, you won't. And I don't care what the knots are. You don't, you don't covet what he has. You don't covet what his ambitions are. Maybe he's sitting on better farm ground than I am. Maybe he's got a horse of a different color, as the saying goes. I'm not supposed to covet any of those things. But if he needs help, I'm supposed to offer it. And I'm supposed to offer it lovingly. Now, that love, here's the, here's the catch-22 part of this one. That love is talking about there is not Brotherly love. This is not neighborly kindness. This is agape. This is love as God has it. Love, deep, lasting, and unconditional. That's what we're supposed to have. Now my question to you is, Ed, do you think that's possible? That I can have the love as God has it and express it to my neighbor? unconditionally, when I cannot stand that man. <laughs> if any of the neighbors are watching, uh, hey, that's, just, that's just a figure speech. If you're not watching, I mean you. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. You cannot love with God's love. But God can. Now my question to you is, who as a believer do you think, or you believe, or do you profess, is indwelling you? And God can love with agape. It's the only love he's got. It doesn't begin. It doesn't end. It doesn't wane. It doesn't leave. And it is the reason he sent his son. Now the spirit of that son indwelling you with the spirit of his father is fully capable of agape, of agape, of expressing that love. And he can do it through you. As a matter of fact, he's chosen you for that purpose. We go back to those earlier verses and it talks about whether it's Caesar, whether it's Hitler, whether it's George Washington, John Kennedy. I don't care who it is. Abraham Lincoln. That God has chosen to put those people in there for specific times to do good. If they don't do good, they're going to answer to God. And maybe to a lot of other things before they get there. But... That was the reason they were put there. The reason we're put where we are, which is in the very body of Christ, is that the love of God can be expressed through us. Do you see that talked about any human ruler? That they're put there so that God can express his love to you through them? It doesn't say that, does it? But you are placed where you are. That the love of God can be expressed through you, through those that need to see it, those who can hear the gospel, and respond because of what you have expressed. There is ministry. It can happen over a cup of coffee. It can happen over a can of angle worms at the fishing hole. It can happen in church once in a while, can it, Pastor? And it can happen with you. I would strongly encourage you to go back and you look at these verses again. And let's not apply them to, oh well, this guy's not a Democrat, I can't like him. This guy's not a Republican, I can't love him. No, you look at your neighbor. Now look at the, now look at the office that God has given to you. A prince of the kingdom, by the way, if you're a believer. And let him love that person through you. And then watch what he can do with that. Throw in a little prayer around the edges for seasoning, because it'll help you out too. Questions, comments? Romans 13, so far. No questions? Ed, would you close in prayer for us, please?